think. Or it's kind of a ritual, in which case, you know, in the Masonic tradition, you don't get the answers unless you ask the question. If we're asking the questions, are they providing the answers in exquisite ritual form? I think you're right on target, to be honest with you. They may not be able to be permitted to say what they believe to be there, but they can show the data and let somebody outside the system give the answer. And therefore, they protected their responsibility, their oaths, and we all come to know the truth. Um, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, it really is, I think. Um, that's a good answer, Richard. Daryl, Daryl and Richard, uh, uh, everybody, I, I want to take this... So I don't mean to take out the air here, but I want to take it one step further about looking for something. You know, coming back to the Great Pyramid and the mathematical redundancies that are literally riddled, bedded, matrix, matrixized, or I don't even know how to say that word. I'm making up words here. Matrixed, yeah, throughout this structure. Matricized. And, you know, and what we might, as, as Richard has been, you know, hinting, Phantomly about what we're starting to see here in Jezero. Let me give you a little story. So what I've noticed, my, my children over the years have been in school, and one of the things that the school system here in Vancouver, in British Columbia, Canada, so I suspect pretty much in many, many countries they do, is they identify very early children with high mathematical skill. And they separate them immediately, not socially out of their classroom, but for special math courses. And they keep an eye on them. And we have stories of this. We actually have a listener um, who, I won't name his name, but his, his son was one of these people that were identified early. He's from Canada, and I, he actually went to university at the same time I went, and he mysteriously disappeared. And there's a whole long story behind it, but he was a mathematical genius. If the math is so complex or so, you know, even multi-dimensional, are they, meaning the agencies here, as Richard outlined, literally looking into the children and their, 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 their mathematical prowess to potentially unlock secrets that are here either on Earth, your example of the Great Pyramid, or even perhaps on Mars in the Jezero Crater? I would guess yes. Well, let me interject a personal point of privilege here because when I was growing up, from grammar school through high school, I was absolutely befuddled by why they kept giving us, particularly when I was in, in grade school, so many damned IQ tests. It's like almost every other week we had, you know, we actually, at one level, we loved it because it wasn't, you know, classroom work. It was different. But at the other level, it was a test. And they did it again and again and again. And, of course, looking back from the hindsight of, you know, decades, I realized, kind of like that NBC television show, The Pretender, they were looking for people. They were looking for certain talents and proclivities and and, and uh, interest and all that. And of course, I was totally rejected because I'm such a rebel and revolutionary. I would make a horrible member of any government <laughs> team. So they, they passed me over, kind of like Passover, but they gave us the damn tests. And I think, Andrew, you're right on. They were, and maybe still are, looking for those few that can be invited inside to be the special one. Well, I know they do. I, I know they do that in code breaking. Uh, so, in code breaking, they always try for that and try to find talent. Mm. Uh, and you can find the history of World War II where they were working on ciphers. Well, that whole group, the the magic group and Friedman and all that. I mean, yes. that gets into some very. Deep, did you ever get deeply into that? Only in the terms of reading, like everyone else did, the books that were available after the war. Um, that was no, I, I wasn't personally involved in that type of material. Are you? I have a thought. Yes, Ron, go ahead. If uh, this putative other group, and I'm thinking that a lot of this stuff are shots in the dark. You know, 
we are... Um, Wait a minute, are we talking uh, terrestrial groups or extraterrestrial? All of them. What they're doing is uh, may not be directed or focused as, as well as we think it is, where it's just different. I mean, nobody's ever come up with a better uh, metaphor for the situation than Charles Fort and his um, warm and fuzzy remarks that we are just cattle. Because um, what do you do with cattle? Uh, you make sure they got a salt lick and a pile of hay over in the corner, and then they won't give you any trouble. Uh, and so if there's anything exceptional about them, and this is where we have to take it beyond cattle, because we don't usually do anything with cattle except to eat them, uh, the, uh, if they're looking for special talents, it's more likely that it's on our side than on theirs. I don't think that the I don't think that the outside I'd call them the overseers, just on a basic model that uh, this is property and uh, there are people that feel like they're in charge of it. And then we have our normal perversion of humanity, which is known as bureaucracy, which are people that insert themselves in the middle. They want to be the uh, they want to be the channel through which this uh, overseeing is done. And thus we get all our ruling classes and everything else, and that engenders a whole bunch of uh, <clears throat> creation of mythology and histories and religions, uh, every, every organizational thing they can come up with. And we're coming up with that, not somebody else, because as far as the else's are concerned, you know, we're just here, as long as we're not causing too much trouble. Uh, that's oh, wait, 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 wait. There, and this is where I kind of depart from Ford. Fort assumed a monolithic other. They no, own. he didn't. Well, they own us. We're their property. But who is the there? If there are factions, if there are the pirates, and there are the guardians, and then above them there's other levels of bureaucracy, who actually is interacting with Homo sapiens, and who is treating us like cattle, and who is treating us as something a lot more? Uh, well, in a sense, they're all treating us like cattle. But the, uh, I mean, let me ask you this about pirates. I know that I, I, I sparked on this when the... Ron, you there? Ah, they... Oh, I muted myself. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> uh, when, the two, when you and Daryl brought up the word pirate, uh, you know, name a good pirate. Okay, Sir you know, Francis it doesn't Drake. Have, I mean, it does. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. Who? Sir Francis Johnny Drake. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Johnny Depp. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's go. To, uh, well, I, I remember his. Uh, his Sir Walter his famous, Raleigh. Famous catch. Uh, no, he was a buccaneer, was he not? Is there really a distinction with the difference there? Yeah, a buccaneer works for the crown, taking out pirates. Privateer, you know, prior privateer. Yeah, I think he was a private. I think he was a privateer. Uh, the uh, pirates are in it for the pirates. You know, I mean, think of the last, since you brought up those actually very good movies, especially the first three. Um, you know, it's like Pirates Code. Uh, these be more like guidelines. Remember that um, Jeffrey Rush's comment, or um, uh, or Johnny Depp saying, "I'm a pirate." That's what pirates do, <laughs> which he said several times. Uh, you know, I don't think that I don't think they're a trustworthy asset on either side. And as far as the reason I said that there's lots of them is that uh, lots of factions is that Fort makes it clear that there's an, there are numerous groups struggling over the uh, reins of ownership here. You know, he doesn't take it farther than that, but he's. Uh, you know, it makes it clear, it's obvious that there's more than one faction out there. The question yeah. is, what do they want from us? All this bit with the testing? Uh, yeah, I'm one of those two. You know, I was getting, uh, we had to take we had to take tests to get into the kindergarten, the school I went went to. Uh, they were they were screening, screening, screening all the time. Mm. And, you know, I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're looking for. But, uh, well, the, uh, I feel like a bass being thrown back. <clears throat> anyway, you we, know, yeah, Richard, I know the Richard, feeling. Richard, yes, there's a, there's a funny angle here with um, buccaneers and yeah. the whole topic of pirates. 
Well, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I mean, Buccaneers are still pirates, right? Right. Um, and they won the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> oh, and, how and, interesting. No, I mean, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl was so emphasized. The, most of the commercials in the Super Bowl had to do with astronauts, flying cars, you name it. Go and look. Go and YouTube it. it the whole focus was advanced technology, aliens, meeting them, a whole bit. Women in space. It, it was extraordinary. And the Buccaneers won. It's, it's just interesting. It just could be an accident, but it was it's very interesting. <laughs> well, remember what FDR said in politics, and this is politics, even if it's CG politics, there are no such things as coincidences. Yeah. Arr. It happens by accident. <laughs> hey guys, we are we are at the bottom of the hour. <clears throat> when we come back, um, I'm, I'm presuming that Tim is rapidly coming up to speed and will join us for some very interesting new discussions and revelations. We're going to take all, all this entire conversation to Jezero Crater, Daryl, on Mars, and I'm going to show you a stunning, I use that term very advisedly, a stunning, redundant connection between where NASA is tonight and the Great Plateau, the, the Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid there in Egypt. And uh, you can't get any more at the cutting edge than that. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. You are on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. With a cast of thousands and a mystery, who were the builders? We shall return. is midnight.com Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Night of midnight here in the land of enchantment. It is 12:30 here in the high western deserts. In the background, we hear the intonations of Paul Horn, who got to do this extraordinary thing: chant and resonate and play a flute in the king's chamber of the incredible, archaically astonishingly old King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid at Giza. So what I want to do now is I want to take everyone from Giza, the Giza Plateau, to Mars. For that, you're going to have to go back to the other side of midnight, our URL, 
click on the banner that will take you for tonight's show to uh, the uh, Sunday night to the guest page and you're going to click on my items under the banner there and you're going to scroll down to item number seven lucky tetrahedral number seven because this is a um, ESA a Mars Express image taken from orbit by the European Space Agency of Jezero Crater there on Mars. There are several versions of this image. There's a NASA version uh, shot by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Frankly, the Europeans in their portrayal of stuff in space have been more accurate. Their imagery of Sidonia is far more accurate than NASA's weirdly, bizarrely inconsistent imagery over the last couple, three decades. So this is an ESA image. It's oriented so that north is up, east is to the right, west is to the left, and south is at the bottom. <clears throat> As I was looking at this after the landing, and we're looking at all various aspects and trying to figure out is there a dome over this place or is there not, and what's in it that you would want to protect from a dome, I was drawn to some rather interesting features located toward the southern edge of the crater, inside the rim, the crater wall see is an arc there toward the bottom of the image. If you go now to number eight, this is an enlargement of this section rotated 180 degrees, so north is now at the bottom and south and the crater rim are at the top. And what I noticed were these large standalone structures and the organization of a complex encompassing two sets of them, one on the right, made of large objects, and a smaller grouping on the left. But first of all, as I looked at this, I thought, oh my gosh, because that geometry looked incredibly familiar. Didn't take long to realize what I was looking at, which will take us now to image number nine. Number, number nine. Nine. If you overlay the geometric pattern of the three large pyramids on the Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid, or Khufu, the Middle Pyramid, or Kephrin, and the Smaller Pyramid, which is known in Greek as Mycerinus, um, you'll notice that the geometry and the southern end of the Jezero Crater on Mars is identical Look at the overlay. Is identical to the geometry of the layout of the three main pyramids at Giza. And then, if you go to the next level, which is number 10, now you're going to look at the image of the structures on the left, not the big guys on the right, but the ones on the left. And you can see, I've oriented now the uh, Giza pyramids in the inset yellow on black. Next to it is the inset of the belt stars in the constellation of Orion, who my friend and colleague Robert Baval many, many years ago associated in what's called the Orion alignment theory with the belt stars of Orion. There are three stars, uh, two of which are in a line, and the third is offset from that line. And the offset <clears throat> is almost exactly the same offset as the three main pyramids, starting with the Great Pyramid at Giza on the Giza Plateau. That same geometry applies with stunning accuracy to what we find at the southern end of the Jezero Crater on Mars. And it's not present just once, it's present twice. Remember, the way you communicate a message is redundancy. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. Or you say it several different ways so you wind up with the same message. Um, in the Baval model, um, if you look very carefully at the details of the layout of these two sets of what I call Giza templates, one, an actual one-on-one -on -one template, the one, the smaller grouping on the left, and the larger template on the right that appears to be, for some reason, a mirror image of the Giza geometry and the smaller pyramids on the left, 
the only way that I can kind of reconcile what's going on here is to look at the actual motions of the stars in the Orion Belt model that are involved. So that means you click on item 11. This is now a gorgeous color image uh, taken by an amateur here on Earth. I don't remember his name at the moment. And on the right you'll see the star that corresponds to the smaller pyramid on the Giza Plateau in Babal's model. This is called Mintaka. The middle one is called Analim, and the one on the far left is called Alnatak. And they're all um, almost a thousand or more light years away. And even though they have reasonable space motions, they're so far away that even over the time scale of tens or hundreds of thousands of years, they move very little. And I put up a graphic the other night one of our earlier shows a couple of weekends past showing the movements of the constellation of Orion and the constellation itself all around these belt stars moves in various directions. But these three maintain this configuration with extraordinary fidelity over an immense period of time. And if you look on the right, you'll see there's a little arrow extending to the uh, bottom left from Mintaka. And there is a series of yellow, green, blue, and white lines extending in the upper right. And then they grade into a dotted white line. And the entire length of that line to the star is about a million years. This is how far in space, if you viewed from Earth a million years ago, you would have seen Mintaka move. And because the stars are all in similar distances, thousand or more light years away and are moving in roughly the same directions this configuration would maintain itself for at least about a million earth years the red arrow is the length projected into the future of a hundred thousand years where Mintaka is going to move uh, in a million years from now so reeling the film backwards um, the yellow line the green line the blue line white line that takes us back to about 450,000 years in the past which takes us to item number 12 because item number 12 is the same as item number uh, what is it 9 or 10 uh, let me look here uh, it is in fact number 10 okay and if you project the actual motions of the Muntaka star onto the geometry of the layout of the Jezero structures or pyramids, you can see that if you reel the clock backward, if you run the film backward, the starting point for when these objects were created matches eerily where the proper motion of Mintaka would have taken the star backward in time around 450,000 years for the grouping on the right, the big guys, and around 300,000 years for the grouping on the left, which mirrors the geometry to an eerie degree of the Great Pyramids uh, there on the Giza Plateau. Now, why is, are these numbers important? Because our independent dating of Sidonia, remember the alignment of the Earth rising over the face on Mars? the first astronomical alignments I ever did with the Mars material decades ago is in exactly the same time frame between 450,000 years and around 300,000 years ago. So this brings us to a very interesting uh, set of potential implications. The size of the complex on the right, what I call the mirror image of Giza, is staggering. Each of these pyramids on the right and then the one representing Mintaka are on the order of between 4,000 and 5,000 feet across. In other words, a mile. They're the same size as the pyramids in the city at Sidonia and the same size as the DNM pyramid to the south and the same size as the face on Mars itself. 
the smaller version on the left there in this image, they're a little more reasonable. They're around uh, 2,000 to 2,500 feet across, let's say half a mile, okay? And they're arrayed in the exact geometry of the pyramids at Giza and the orientation contemporaneously of the three belt stars in Orion. And why that's interesting is because on Earth, in this time frame, roughly 300,000 years ago, we have a genetic eruption in Africa of something called the mitochondrial Eve, where geneticists have traced back genetically our code, our human code, our homo sapiens code, to a sapient primate in Africa at a roughly the 300,000 year time horizon. It's almost unmistakable and, you know, impossible to avoid the conclusion that somehow what happened at Jezero was migrated from the southern part of this crater all the way to Earth and duplicated on an even smaller scale on the Giza Plateau with time constants built in, with mathematics and geometry encoding the relationships of the planet to the precession of its motions on its axis, to its motions around the sun, to the eruption of genetic heritage traceable to Homo sapiens. In other words, we're looking in this model at the jumping off place, the transport station of who we once were and what we have become in the transition from Mars to planet Earth. And the floor is now open for vigorous discussion, attacks, criticism, whatever. Well, I have an attack. <laughs> Go for it. No. Uh, no, I knew just because you said that I had to say that. Uh, the uh, Daryl, I've got a question. Do you really think that the pyramids were built in the fourth dynasty, etc.? I question it. Uh, there is a, a, a discussion. Finding a new uh, Herodotus made a comment that he believed that the work that was being done by Khufu on a Turn causeway right. was as grand a product, product as was the pyramid itself. And the fact that the interior of that pyramid is uh, without any of the normal paintings you would expect to find Get in a royal ready tomb to turn left. indicate that it was built for some other purpose than to house the body of a king. Um, well, let's, let's, it, let's assume it was a monument. Yeah, okay, let's assume it was a monument then. Yes, I, I, I they did. Because they, yeah, because they did mind. that. Never you mind, know, I'll find uh, a new without, route. Uh, I think it goes further than that. But, you know, the, uh, to get caught up okay. in whether it was a Let's tomb find or not, a new route. very few of them were tombs anyway. Uh, well, I don't think it was a the, monument as much, Ron, as a machine. These are solid-state torsion field amplifying machines, which is the appropriate time to interject this, because okay. earlier, earlier in the in the evening, when I laid out the precision of the alignment of the geese, of the uh, pyramids with north. Somehow we had a dropout, and nobody in the audience heard that minute or two minutes of explanation, so I'm going to do it again. If you assume, because of the precision, Daryl, that you've measured in the pyramid, that that five arc minute deviation from true north is not an error or the, the problems of building in limestone, etc., but in fact, an error introduced by physical motions of the rotation of the African plate on the crust, on, on the mantle of the planet Earth, and you reel back the clock, <clears throat> and this was based on a calculation I made that stemmed from a 1973 paper where some geodesists were trying to date the Great Pyramid and the Giza complex using plate tectonics as a kind of internal clock and they stopped their calculation because they quickly realized that the motion within the historical period you know the first dynasty second that kind of thing did not work 
the pyramids are much, much older based on running back the clock, just like I did with the proper motions of Mintaka. Because if you forget the pyramids themselves and say that they could have been rebuilt several times on an earlier ground plan, an earlier mega architectural layout for the purpose of mirroring what was in fact the case at Jezero, where the builders came from in this model, humans who came back to Earth from Mars, then everything falls into place because the dating, if you say it's an architectural plan and it's in sync with the rotation of the African plate, if you reel that clock backwards, you wind up with roughly 300,000 years for the plan of Giza itself, which is identical within the errors to the smaller counterpart of Giza that's now sitting tonight enigmatically oriented correctly with the sky at Jezero. I think the next 30 days and the information we are about to learn will change how we view ourselves and the world and the universe around us. And, well, and maybe some of us. <laughs> and, Richard, yeah. be, yes. I know we're getting close to the end, and I don't want to... Uh, not only around us, Daryl, but within. Because the big question here that Richard's poking at, now we're running out of time, is why is the larger complex mirrored? It's a mirror. How, what, what does that mean? Like, we, we've been going, uh, like, I, I'm still baffled by this. Like, Richard, do you want to explain? Like, like this is... A... Well, to me, it marks, and Daryl, follow me if you can, and Brian, help him if, if you need to. It indicates to me a AD and BC, a juncture, a rupture of the calendar, that before the smaller guys were built, things were going in a certain direction, in a certain evolution, in a certain development. And these are incredibly ancient structures because if you look at the erosion of the complexes and you look at the dating I did at Sidonia, <clears throat> we're talking like half a million years, which even under vanishingly thin atmospheric models by NASA is a hell of a long time to maintain big, big structures, which I think is a doorway, Daryl, to what you discovered on the Giza Plateau. If you want to have something that lasts for the ages, that outlasts all perishable media, trivial things like books and tapes and discs and crystals and whatever. You build it massively in stone, which erodes the least under planetary conditions of anything we can conceive of creating. I mean, look at mountains. They last for geological periods of time. If you want to build a time capsule that communicates a message, a story, a narrative, a history for future generations, thousands of which are yet unborn. You do it in massive structures and you lay them out on planets to be observed eons or millennia later. And the reason I think that it's mirrored, and this is going to sound really kooky to an awful lot of people, I think that demarcation between the big representation of Giza on the right and the smaller representation on the left on Mars at Jezero is because somehow the planet, maybe the entire solar system, went through a mirroring chirality dimensional shift. And the question is, was it by accident? Was it a byproduct of an incredible interplanetary war fought with torsion weapons which literally can wrench space-time into shreds and put it back together or does it indicate it was done intentionally kind of like the phantom zone Keep in right the superman and then exit you know, right. mythos have we been intentionally imprisoned in our exit. own dimensional right. version of the Phantom Zone and these pyramids on Mars and their duplication on Earth 
and the fact that you constantly see these massive monuments, Get ready both at Teotihuacan in Mexico and the Xi'an pyramids with the same geometry in China. Are you listening, Beijing? Turn left. They all were surrounded at one time by water, which indicates a mirror and the meta message. The reality we are currently experiencing as a mirror image of what came before, or in other words, as above, mirrored is what is below. Well, you have another aspect is this mitochondria you're talking about. These, this is in our evolution, and this is actually symbiosis. We, we can't really survive without them. They're part of us and we're part of them now. You're we're talking about the guys upstairs, Go right? Go straight on. I'm talking about the mitochondria mentioned ah, okay. 300,000 years ago. Okay. So this is a point around 300,000 years ago when one entity decided to come into one of our cells and we allowed it and it became a symbiosis. And they, they offer us energy. It's a form of releasing our energy in our body and so on. So we actually evolved through that symbiosis. We exist mm -hmm. because of that symbiosis. Some people say the mitochondria communicate Maybe this is the key point, this is the force in Star Wars, maybe it's the universal consciousness when they connect up, maybe it's what makes us connect in a different way. So it is a very interesting subject, we've done a show about this uh, a couple of years ago. But that, that's an interesting point, so I think humanity on this planet would have evolved at that point, as you say. I think in terms of the monuments, I think we obviously have two, two representations of Orion here. Keep left. And, and then not only is left. it mirrored, the larger one is obviously a, a previous older civilization. The newer is possibly a devolved. Turn left. That's version. my reading, yes, yes. And it's not only mirrored, but it's also rotated around 90 degrees as well. So could that also be a mark Go straight of on. these monuments? Well, you know, hang on, hang on. No, 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 disaster. hang on, hang on, because it's not 90, it's 30 degrees. The alignment of the big guys on the right and the alignment of the big guys on the smaller model on the left, 30 degrees, which by the way, Daryl, is the exact latitude of the Giza Plateau pyramids. Exactly, 30 degrees. Um, it, it, I, I, I don't want to talk about some things. I'm feeling comfortable about talking about them, but there is a mystery in the old texts and it's hard to understand, but the relationship has to do with the origin of humanity. Go straight on. And I really don't want to discuss it too depth this because it is a religious item and I would probably offend uh, more people than I care to offend, but mm. I believe humanity is is pretty special. You know what I mean? And we have a I think we have a role to play in the future. And I think that's going to become very apparent. Get ready to turn right. And I hate to say it, right. but isn't that what everybody always says? <laughs> uh, it may be, but that's it's better than to yeah, think about history. Just, we are finished. I think it's better to think that than what uh, f uh, f Charles Ford's meant when we were cattle. I don't believe that we're chattel. Hmm. I don't never have and never will. But Daryl, 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 science is not about belief, it's about evidence. You know, I don't care what you believe or I believe or anybody. I want to find the evidence. I have now found two stunning connections between Mars and Giza. One is this at Jezreel, that's new, that's in the last you know, few, few weeks. The earlier one was the latitude of the Giza Plateau pyramids and the Sphinx and the latitude of Sidonia and the face and the DNM pyramid on Mars because one is the reflection of the sign and the cotangent of the other and the odds against that, I calculated once, were like 7,000 to 1. So someone redundantly has been saying with these massive Martian monuments, look here, here is your origins, here's how you became what you are, except someone else does not want us to know and have turned heaven and earth, that may not be just a cliche, to keep us as a species from knowing and as you said a moment ago, Daryl, we could be within days of that cover-up shattering into a million pieces with the Chinese sitting on the plains of Utopia tonight waiting for something because we have no 
images. Why not? Uh, Richard, there's yeah. an excellent piece of evidence uh, that I I should stick it in before the show's over. The uh, Mark Laner's research for the ARE people. Oh, at, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. I wonder if Daryl's yeah, even aware of that. Yeah, that's relatively recent. And the uh, they started by measuring and laying out the original positions of the cornerstones for the Great Pyramid. And uh, so they got that accomplished. But then they noticed something that subsequent to that, the entire structure was shifted about two and a half inches. I mean, rotated about two hundred, two and a half inches. Uh, and so a correction was introduced after the cornerstones. That kind of reinforces the idea that they were rebuilt at various times. Oh, my gosh, guys. We are running out of time. <laughs> Figures. There are more secrets to be found about the Great Pyramid, and tune in tomorrow. <laughs> well, not actually tomorrow. We have to wait till next week. But, uh, yes, there's a lot going on. And, unfortunately, we have no more time tonight to, uh, to regale everybody with this. But I guarantee you, next Sunday night, we're going to all meet here. Seconds. We're all going to meet here at the same time and the same bad channel. And we're going to do this all again with new information and lo and behold, we may actually have data from the Chinese. I want to thank all my guests this morning. Daryl Gusson, his nephew Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. Ron Gerbron, Andrew Curry, Tim Saunders, Kinthea, and Keith. And um, we'll do this again next weekend. And I can't say what's going to happen Sunday, but Saturday night is going to be one hell of a show because we may, in fact, have data from the Chinese mission to Mars. So until then, third star on the left, straight on till morning. Good night, everyone, and keep looking up. <laughs>